from a layman's point of view, a lot of what you're talking about was monitoring at the moment. Is there capacity for it to be a two-way thing? So you could, for example, uh, monitor stock in a paddock and then say, okay, it's time for them to move and open a gate remotely, or are we kind of not there yet? Yeah, uh, so the short answer is yes, it will be a two-way platform, but the technology has been designed to have many, many terminals talking to one satellite, not one satellite talking to many, many terminals. So firmware upgrades over the air will be possible, so if you need to update something, you won't have to go around and plug in a USB into every single water tank around Australia, which is good. Um, the complications around having one device opening a gate is a little bit more problematic, but it's, yeah, I mean, look, it'll happen, it's just not going to be in the first rollout of a commercial product. And do you think, uh, you're talking about this being small data at the moment, obviously, as time goes on, people will probably want to see bigger data. You know, yep. I know using my mobile phone, I used to think having a gig a month was heaps. Yep. Now I burn through it in a day. Uh, is that going to change as well, do you think? Look, um, the, the foundation of our technology has specifically been designed for small amounts of data to make it as cheap as possible. Now, it's classic horses for courses, so different communications platforms. And we're not the only ag IoT communication platform that will be applicable out there. There are plenty of others, and it's a horses for courses situation. I mean, the analogy that I use is that, um, you know, you can, for, for small IoT transmissions, um, using existing satellite technology is a little bit riding, like riding a push bike down a freeway. Now, you can do it really well, but you're paying for the associated infrastructure overheads, and so it becomes very expensive. What we've done is actually build a bike lane to ride a bike down. In fact, we've actually made a bike lane and we can drive hundreds of thousands of bikes down it. That works really well until you try and drive a truck down the bike lane. So it's a horses for courses situation. And we're very, we're, we know where we focus and where we add value and that's in the small data transmission. Okay, any questions from the audience? Put your hand up very high so I can see it if anybody does have a question. While you're continuing to think. Um, a question for Hayley. Um, you were talking, Hayley, about um, that, you know, that idea of going carbon neutral. Do you feel, and you kind of touched on this, but to expand on it a little bit, do you feel like the demand from that is coming from your customers? Do you feel like it's coming from you as a company? Uh, I think it will come from our customers eventually. Um, it's, I think, uh, as Tanya was saying, cost is still the number one driver of purchasing behaviour. So um, I think it's going to become an expectation that everybody does it point blank. If, if companies aren't doing it, then they're just not going to be competitive, full stop. But from our perspective, it's certainly something that our international customers are driving, not something that our Australian customers are driving. I think in Australia, we take for granted that we live in a country with beautiful, clean air and an abundance, well, it doesn't always feel like an abundance of resources when you're uh, out on the land, but we really do have a very clean economy here. and. For countries such as Asia, where you know, it's so obvious to them the pollution that is happening uh, in their backyard, it's a huge, it's, it is a demand from those countries, but certainly not from an Australian perspective. Um, we're not doing it for them, we're doing it more for our own business, financial stability and um, long-term longevity. And so on that, what level of, uh, of, of, I guess, questioning do you have from your customers, if you say we're environmentally sustainable, do they just accept that or do they say, oh, hang on, how? Uh, that's, look, people relate to uh, the projects that you're doing. So when we talk about platypi and we talk about um, the different endangered species in our wetlands, when we talk about heat reflective paint and solar panels, people can relate to the physical projects. They certainly can't relate to carbon. Uh, I think there's a general lack of understanding of what the greenhouse effect is um, just on the whole across all levels. So certainly, if we if we tackled them from a carbon neutral perspective, our customers sort of look at us blankly, do not understand what that means. But when we start to talk about go for a walk in the wetlands, have a look at the natural environment, reconnect with nature, that is certainly a message that connects. Mm, beautiful. Now I do have more questions, but I don't want to be a hog. Does anyone have any questions? Any curiosities? Oh, I saw someone scratching their eye. That was almost the question. You know that horrible feeling when you think if you're at an auction and you might accidentally put your head, like, scratch and they'll count it as a bid? Almost got you. Not quite. Uh, that's okay. 
I've got a few more questions. We'll keep going. Um, on you were talking too, Hayley, about that idea of trying to use data to, to get a better idea of, of what your customers want. Are you at the point where you can use data or analyse information that's available to you to try and pick trends? Because obviously the winemaking industry can be quite trend driven, you know, just in the past couple of years they've seen this all of a sudden Prosecco and Rosé are cool. How long is that going to last? Are, are you at the point where you can try to pick those trends or is that still too hard to do? Look, it depends on your business model. For us, uh, as a 150-year-old business, we're not particularly interested in trends. So uh, the trend might happen and it might pass us by. We can play in the trend, if we'd like, by purchasing grapes external to our property. So we've got some flexibility there. We can certainly see um, that customers are trending towards those alternative varietals, uh, which they weren't doing 20 years ago. Um, but for us as a business, it doesn't... We're not regrafting our vines over to, say, produce, I don't Pinot Grigio, for example. So still, the core varietals that uh, we're growing are still popular in the marketplace. So Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, unfortunately, um, <laughs> and Chardonnay is still there. We're big growers in Marsan, um, but I, yeah, it's. You can definitely see the trends. We've got a lot of analytics available on customer behaviour because a lot of wineries do own that end-to-end -end channel. So you have a lot of... Um, you have a strong relationship with your customers and what they're buying, and you're looking at that all the time. But as I said, it's more about enticing them to buy your brand. So many people in Australia, wineries, produce Shiraz. What makes your Shiraz more attractive to your neighbours? And that's, that is a bigger challenge for us than understanding consumer preferences. Thank you. We've got a question at the front, I believe. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in how digital technology will transform the way we market Australian products. Mm. And so I guess I'd be interested in your panel's comments about the actual preparedness to work in data cooperatives, where you start to say, who are in Australian data, and what does this mean about our whole production system and our sustainable mm -hmm. Who'd like to tackle that one? Tanya, maybe? Yeah, look, um, that very much links into the whole kind of debate that's been going around for several years around Australian brand and provenance and how do you get the premium and, you know, people look at the branding that's been done in New Zealand and um, see that as very effective. Where in Australia we seem to divert to, um, you know, infighting between states and, and companies. So I think absolutely there's a need for um, some common voice, some common underpinning. Um, but it's it's beyond just the branding and the marketing to how do you actually validate then origin and authenticity and provenance and all those sorts of things. I know certainly it's increasingly sought after. Um, you know, there were some, some issues in our sector recently where China, um, you know, uh, imposing some uh, import restrictions on heavily processed food, needing to be able to validate the safety um, of that, even though it's very, very low risk. And I think it gets back to that point of because for, for our um, export markets, safety is such a high factor and safety goes to not only whether or not there are um, toxins, pathogens, et cetera, in the product, but also just around origin and authenticity and can I trust that that packet of biscuits, let alone that piece of steak, is actually from um, the true source. So um, I guess in answer to your question, is there a need, is there a willingness for some sort of collaboration? Um, I think there is, and I think that's a space where I think some of the CRCs are starting to look into, but um, there is also a huge competitive advantage for the companies that can crack it, and that's where I think it becomes difficult because you do have some individual companies that are pursuing their own traceability systems. Um, so I think it's a combination of both. I think some industry-wide approaches would be worth it, but also I think companies will continue to do some of their own. I was imagine too one of the challenges with that would be if you're looking to do it in a cooperative way, uh, a lot of that big data is probably pretty valuable to some of those companies and they may not want to share it super yeah. freely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think one of the challenges is there's um, multiple accreditations worldwide. Just thinking of the carbon accreditation itself, so one of the main challenges for us as an organisation is we use uh, Enviromark solutions for our carbon accreditation. They're a New Zealand and Australian government initiative um, they cover the three standards, but Australia is working away on their own brand Australia carbon accreditation, which we are above and beyond that level of accreditation, but we'd have to pay twice to be able to participate in both. So um, 
I almost see the biggest challenge for us working together in being able to build this brand Australia clean and green is how do you work from a global uh, perspective and build it back so that we actually have common accreditations globally and we're not just sticking to Australia has an accreditation, New Zealand has an accreditation, China has an accreditation. That's certainly been uh, one of the biggest limitations for us as a brand. Mm. Mm. Any further questions? Yes. yes. Uh, this is probably a question for, is that okay? Is that on? Yep. Question for Tanya. Um, I'm just interested in what the Australian Food and Grocery Council is doing to distinguish between uh, the way that tech can transform digital marketing claims versus health claims. So there is a difference between the two, and I'm just wondering if there is any differentiation that you're seeing your organisation or member organisations um, making in this respect. Oh, you've got me there. <laughs> um, yeah, look, sorry, I'm not in a capacity to be able to answer that one. Sorry. Okay. Uh, a, a question that may be in, this, in, a, in a vaguely similar vein. We've been talking a lot about the idea of big data and, and a lot more interaction with consumers. Uh, and primarily we've been talking about that being a positive thing, being making life easier. Is there a risk around uh, misinformation when it comes to particularly social media? You know, we see quite often people talking about um, whether or not a product has palm sugar in it, whether or not it's halal certified. Is, is that a, a challenge that's been brought on by some of this technology? Oh, look, I think it's a challenge that's always there in any marketing for any products, for, you know, and that's why we have legislation around misleading and deceptive claims, that ultimately any company has to be accountable for the claims that they make, whether they're health-related or, or other. Um, and, you know, Rod Sims from the ACCC will often make that point and take a few test cases um, to the courts to just reassure that... Um, you know, even though you're moving to sort of new forms of marketing, it doesn't um, absolve companies from that. So, um, you know, I think as long as product has ever been traded, there'll always be some companies that push the bounds. Um, but I think um, increasingly, you know, you start to see standards around some of these things and certifications and so on so that um, companies can provide a bit more assurance. Um, and so, you know, things like, you know, palm oil, how do you know something's palm oil free or how do you know if something's, um, you know, meeting certain criteria? Well, that's where you get the independent certification schemes pop up, which allow companies to be able to validate and authenticate the claims that they make. Um, the challenge with that is that it adds a whole extra layer of cost then because to a point Hayley raised, you've then got auditing against all these certification schemes. So you might have a product that has um, fair trade certification, it might have palm oil certification, it might have a forest product certification and so on and so on. And when they're all audited separately, um, it becomes expensive. But it's a, it is all part of how you validate your claim and how you provide that trust and transparency to consumers. And I suppose the other challenge too, which in a large way is beyond the control of manufacturers, is when you'll have someone on, for example, a Facebook page, uh, you know, a company is promoting a product and they'll say, not buying this because of palm oil, even though it doesn't have palm oil in it. And that therein is another challenge too. It, it, it's a, how do you go about trying to combat that side of things? Yeah, yeah look, <laughs> um, and social media has, um, in the area of sustainability, been uh, a loud voice for yeah. um, groups to be able to get traction with some of these issues. Um, not dismissing that. I mean, it plays a really important role in raising the profile of what are important issues that industry has need to, to deal with. Um, but it does get concerning when sometimes um, industry and companies have to be held to account under the law for claims that they make, but individuals um, not necessarily held to the same standard and um, can cause quite a bit of damage to brands and to companies by making false claims. Moderating the ABC pages is a joy. It's one of the best, <laughs> best parts of the job. Uh, anybody else have any questions that they would like to ask? Yes.
I, I'm happy to answer that, uh, or at least pass comment on it. Um, I went to a ADMA conference last Friday, which is the Australian Department of Marketing and Advertising, and they raised this exact issue, is uh, digital skills in businesses are completely lacking. Um, when we look at our own business internally, the number one uh, issue that our employees continue to raise over and over again is, I need more digital skills, I'm not up to speed with this. Um, and one of the biggest challenges we have is this is the first time in society that we're going to have five generations working within a business. I'm not talking about generational ownership. I'm just talking about multiple generations who have varying skill sets, some who have skills for the future and others who have skills uh, that were very relevant to that traditional uh, method of selling and being in business. Um, something that we're looking at internally to combat this is how do we utilise peer-to-peer learning internally to build those digital skills internal within the business and just train our staff up to get those skills. I also think that um, unless businesses acknowledge and accept that creativity is going to be a huge part of uh, their employees' mindset and being able to progress and allow them to actually um, explore their curiosity and grow, uh, those businesses are going to suffer. So. Our education system is predominantly based on rote learning and there's not a lot of creativity space in there. So as organisations, we need to think about how we're going to build creativity in our staff, how we're going to bring digital skills into our teams. Um, I think we can do this, but there is so much work to do internal within our organisations to bring people up to speed so that they're ready for the future. Things we see in our industry is that as companies, um, you know, increasingly facing cost pressures and needing to automate factories, that then that requires a whole new skill set to then be able to run those new sorts of technologies, um, and that's often quite challenged. We, we um, find that that skill set's not often here. So, I know it's an area um, that we just addressed in our pre-budget submission that um, there is a need for some government assistance around transitioning people to the new new sorts of skills needed for the future. Ailey, if I could ask you to maybe take a bit of a broader view on this question, and I know it's hard to speak for an industry, but I guess the other side of, of that question too is the desire to want to take on these new skills because there will be you know, a natural arc of people that are really interested in this stuff and think, oh, there's opportunity here, and other people who just see it as an extra task and something that they don't want to do. I think it's all about uh, mindset. Mm. Um, if you don't have a mindset to learn, you're going to get left behind. I don't think that's particularly anything new. Um, if people are working in an organisation that's moving ahead and looking to bring in those skills, I would imagine individuals who don't have a mindset for change will step out of those organisations. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see it as any, being any anything different. Mm. I don't think it's generational. I don't think older people, younger people have greater capacity to learn. I think it's all in the way that you approach your day to day. And um, you know, if you've got a mindset for change, then you will absolutely thrive in this environment. I think I'll add to that, Nicola. I mean, in our business, we deal with a lot of OEMs, a lot of equipment manufacturers and ag tech companies that are actually coming up with these solutions for farmers. And when they focus on providing a solution rather than just tech, Tech might be part of the solution, but when they provide the solution, Australian farmers are actually quite good at adopting it if it's actually easy to implement. I mean, I think, Peter, you raised the auto steer technology. Uh, Australia had the best auto steer technology adoption rates of any of the developed economies in the world, bar none, according to Case and John Deere, if you speak to them. They weren't buying satellite technology. They were saving money because they weren't overlapping so many times on when, when they were driving the, the tractors around. Um, same thing with that simple use case of the water tank monitor. When the farmer doesn't care if it's a carrier pigeon that delivers the data, they just want to know that their cows have got some water. Mm -hmm. So there's adoption of technology and there's adoption of solutions and I think the, the really good OEMs are the people that are focusing on making the solution really simple, you know, more iPhone rather than green screen computers mm -hmm. so that farmers can adopt this technology because we want them being good farmers, not being tech experts. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Peter, from the analysis that, that you've undertaken, you touched on this already, but uh, it surprised me a little bit that, that that nothing new was the biggest limitation for vegetable growers. Surely there's an, an opportunity there for companies to come up with the new. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that takes a bit of unpacking, I think, which we haven't done yet. So, so nothing new could mean there are things there that, that either cost too much or uh, don't really solve a problem. Mm. Um, but certainly there's a big uh, difference across the vegetable industry in terms of, like I showed with the dairy farms, what the small players are doing versus what the big players are doing. So that's probably the most... It's, it's, the, it's the biggest spread in terms of um, capacity to, um, to utilise new technology. So um, the results also show that, that vegetable farms are the ones with the lowest... Um, the highest proportion of people that didn't have a computer mm. were in the vegetable industry. And, I mean, that's to do, obviously, with um, where they come from and the demographics of that, of that industry. So... There's a lot of unpacking of the results to do, but um, you know, it seems seems like there's a fair bit of work there for us. Mm. Excellent, that's good. Uh, follow on that idea of developing that the product, I suppose, or the solution um, to Tom. Um, do you think an app for each type of thing you can do is the the way that is best for people to deal with things? Are they going to have to have multiple apps? Uh, use drawing perhaps a a slightly odd parallel if you're trying to do home automation at the moment, it's kind of hard. You know, you've got to have Google, you've got to have Apple, you've got to have a bit of everybody and 15 apps to control it. So, from a Miriota perspective, we don't care as long as they're using our chip. To connect. <laughs> um, so, you're talking about interoperability, which is a major issue in the, in the industry. How does my green tractor talk to my red one, which talks to my yellow sprayer? Uh, it's a massive industry, not just in agriculture, but in IoT in general that we see. Um, but a, I mean, there are solution providers that that is their entire business. They actually take um, data streams and different uh, inputs from various sensors and locations and put it into a workable um, interface so that you have got one dashboard for it. So I think that the market will actually come up with a solution for that. I mean, you find now that the major tractor manufacturers are making their data open source because they, they tried to pick the winner and they wanted the winner to be them and then they soon realised that if actually they went down a platform that was closed to other people to extract that data or use their data, then they just weren't going to sell any machinery. Um, so I think that the market's taking care of that and the people that get it right, the people that make that interface user-friendly and uses technology to solve the problem rather than just technology for technology's sake, I think will do really well. And I'll avoid the, the VHS versus beta debate happening all over. Well, correct. Yeah. 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 Uh, any other further questions from the audience? Uh, one up the back here. Yeah, Gary Gale from NAB Agri. Tom, just one for you. Um, last year in this very room we heard from a farmer who'd put up a tower and had a network and four farms around, I can't remember how many, but all using it. Uh, is that market still growing or are you guys just... Yeah, look, that? I mean, that, that I think I remember the, the, the presentation. That was definitely the, the broadband side of things. So, I mean, I, I remember he said it was great because he can watch Netflix. So we are a 24-byte small packet of data service, um, so it's completely the other end. So we're a narrowband service, that's a broadband service. Um, and I don't want to get too involved in that other than to say, yes, it is continuing because people are complaining that they're not getting broadband in the bush. So we, we get that um, coming across our desk all the time. But the important distinction there is that people sometimes think that connectivity means I have to have NBN to every single part of the farm. And you don't necessarily if you only need small amounts of data. So you don't need to be able to watch Netflix at every single water point on a property up near Broome. Well, you can, but obviously the jackaroos won't get much done. But um, you, know, you, you actually only need to know how much water's in the tank. And so you only need, you know, we're talking tiny amounts of data. So it gets back to my point before, but there's horses for courses. So I, I, I still think you're gonna need broadband connectivity at the homestead for most of these applications, because you actually need to look at your phone and you actually need to interpret the data and you need to do some data analytics and, and make your management decisions but you also need the narrowband connectivity for these IoT type applications to really you know, expand the uh, profitability of your businesses. Should very quickly do the maths on how long it would take to download a Hollywood blockbuster at 24 bytes a packet. Might take a while, yeah, yeah. I'd reckon. So um, it's not a lonely jackaroos solution now. <laughs> so like, so I promise you it's a... <laughs> uh, did I see another question up back here? Hi, uh, this might be a question for Peter based on your survey. Um, just having a look at the farmers and the industries of who had access to what and internet and et cetera, et cetera, do you think there's any risk of a digital divide or anything occurring um, 
both either happening now or in the future given the rollout of the NBN? Yeah, so I suppose there's obviously a risk that, um, well, we, we know that what's going to be available um, in cities is going to keep um, expanding and it will be things that we didn't realise are available now, will be available in five years' time. Um, the solutions exist to provide that everywhere, it's just that they cost a lot. So there's a, there's a discussion to be had about um, how, how those solutions are provided. So there's a lot of money being spent at the moment on, um, you know, on, on fixed wireless and satellite and also the mobile black spot program, but there's still an open question about how, that, how that's going to progress as, as the technology itself progresses and, and I have access to things in the city uh, that people elsewhere are going to want access to as well. And, you know, while it's technically feasible to provide that, it, it costs quite a bit. And um, it's, not, it's not clear that we're um, at a spot yet where we can say, well, this is going to be provided by the private sector or individuals and, and government's going to invest in, in this area here. So I think that's, that's, the, that's, that's what needs to become clearer.